All right, Luke chapter 2, verse number 21, and when, the eight, and when eight days, so all this was told them, verse number 20, the shepherds glorifying God, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of a purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was a just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And want you to see that little phrase there, seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit in the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, our time to meet on a Wednesday uh, night, a special night tonight as we reflect upon uh, this last year in preparation for this new year. And I uh, know there's a lot of mixed emotions, un no doubt, about uh, transitioning in this new year. And for many of us, it's just a good riddance uh, to get through of all the things, Lord, of this uh, year and uh, the virus and all the different um, um, limitations and, and just the difference that we've had to go through uh, in this year, Lord. And we look forward with anticipation, uh, Lord, for a great year that you've prepared us for this year. Uh, through this year for next year and we thank you for that Lord we pray that we would be a vessel of honor we'd learn all the lessons that we were supposed to learn uh, Lord uh, this year so that we can prepare ourselves for greater blessings and greater usefulness for you in 2021 in Jesus name amen interesting verse here is we uh, we're past the verse that we look at uh, specifically we start in verse number 21 <clears throat> where the Bible says and when eight days were accomplished <clears throat> for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. And so according to the law in the Old Testament as given to Moses, each male child was to be circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, the eighth day. Uh, interesting, just physiologically speaking, the eighth day is, is, is not just some random uh, number that God threw out there. Uh, the highest level of vitamin K uh, in, uh, in our bloodstream is, is peaks at the age of, of eight days, and uh, then it begins to uh, go down, and it just stabilizes itself at a much lower rate. Vitamin K is essential for blood clotting, and it's interesting how God works all those little details out in regards to um, the eight days. It seems on the surface very insignificant. So the child was to be circumcised the eighth day from birth. This was considered to be a mark in the flesh of belonging to the covenant of God's people, the Jewish people, people of Israel, but also as a ritual of purification. January 1st is the eighth day after the day that we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ. And in Jewish tradition, eight days after a baby was born, the family would have a bris. And so what makes a New Year special is not necessarily uh, this act that was done that commemorated their covenant with the people of God, uh, but the, the naming of Jesus, the, the significance is not so much uh, that Jesus got his name, but that the world was to know his name. Look at the verse there in verse number 21. And when eight days were accomplished, so we fast forward if we look at the 25th of, of December, and then eight days, we come to January 1st, uh, which is the day that the Bible says uh, his name will be called right at this time, shall be was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived uh, there in the womb there of Mary. And so New Year's, can be like this for you and I. Uh, the name of Jesus' is, significance is not so much in that he got a name, but that he got to know what that name was. And so as we begin in preparation for this new year, God wants us to know his name. 
He doesn't just want us to know about him. He wants us to know him on a very real and personal and practical and very uh, intimate way, uh, unlike maybe that we didn't know him this last year or this year. New Year's like that can be for us. This is a year when like the ones at Jesus' breast can learn who Jesus is. It can start a whole new relationship with you and Christ. And uh, his name shall be called. Jesus, we've been looking at that on our uh, Sunday morning lessons. It can be a day when you make those resolutions for the coming year. It can be a time that uh, I'm saying that a few that really have the power, not just resolutions, but the resolutions in your life that can really transform your life and that can really make a difference in your life. And you can end uh, uh, that transition or begin that transition with the great power of God. And so as we look at this thought, his name shall be, was called Jesus. Uh, if we could get the understanding today uh, of what his name means to you personally in my life and your life. Can you imagine what it would be like uh, if this year was a way that you got to know Jesus in a way you've never known him before? You looked for him like you never looked for him before. Uh, you didn't leave Jesus behind as uh, Joseph and Mary left him behind and then go back and uh, find him. Uh, so often our relationship with God is uh, I'll get around to it less. And I'm planning to get close to God this year. And I'm going to read my Bible a lot this year. And I'm going to do something great for God this year. And we're always are planning to get around to serving God and knowing God and walking with God. But for some reason, it just sort of gets squeezed out of our life. And so uh, the challenge that I want to give to us uh, tonight are just a few different practical thoughts uh, that will help us to learn how to get to know this man by the name of Jesus. Uh, but not just a man, your Savior, your Heavenly Father, your everlasting Father, Prince, you know, the things that we've been looking at on these uh, Sunday. The first point I want you to write is this. Live life, and we're going to know Jesus uh, as, uh, as he wants to be known. The number one, we've got to live life in 2021 in light of eternity. We've got to live life in light of eternity, in, in, uh, in regards to eternity. Uh, now, uh, we look at our lives. None of us like to waste time. We waste a lot of time. And much of our life is wasted because of the time uh, that we waste, unscheduled time or, or a time that is just sort of spent on trivial, unimportant things. Now, if you had $1,440 that was deposited into your bank account every day, $1,440 deposited into your account, uh, you had to use it all that day. It wouldn't accumulate. You couldn't save it up over a period of days and weeks and months and cash in later on. You were given that amount of money every day. It would be very difficult for us to be very wise in how we utilize that money, knowing that we had another 1440 coming the next day and another 1440 coming the next day. We would probably be very careless. Uh, with those funds, we would be very uh, flippant maybe and not really structured about that. Uh, and uh, we'd often be uh, uh, very uh, negligent of that. Now the fact is each of us has 1,440 minutes deposited into our life account that we're to use for God every day. And uh, you can't get it back. Uh, it's gone. Uh, those 1,440 minutes uh, is given to you every day. And how you use those minutes, how you use that time is, is your choice. But you can't go back and undo how or what uh, was used. If you live this next year, through the entirety of this year, you'll have spent uh, 8,760 uh, hours uh, to spend. 8,760 hours to spend. That allows for eight hours per day for sleeping, eight hours a day for working, for meals, for commuting time, uh, not figuring days off and things. That leaves us 2,920 hours that uh, is there to be able to be used, to be invested. Now, how will you use those hours that God's entrusted to you? God's given it to you. It's a deposit that God places into your bank account of life every day. And uh, you've got to use it to the maximum on that day. It's gone. To look back and say, well, boy, I wish I would have done that. And I wish I would have said that. And I wish I wouldn't have done that. And I wish I would have lived this way. And I wish I had that focus back here. You can't go back now. We can learn from the past, but we can't go back to the past 
and reaccumulate all of that time that, that was not utilized maybe the way we would have wished it was utilized. Will you use the time that you have, 2,920 hours, apart from those um, eight hours of working, eight hours of sleeping, work, etc. Uh, will you use them in light of eternity, or will you use them and waste them in a significant amount of times in things that have no eternal value? Uh, because you've got one life to live. We've got one life to live. You've been given one life with a, a measure of time. God's entrusted you with that time. Are you going to live and invest and be strategic and on purpose how you use that time for eternity? Or are we just going to sort of waste that time? And all of us, we, I mean, in our country, we waste more food than most countries that have and, and uh, restaurants and things. I mean, they'll fill up dumpsters and, and things. Our government wastes uh, so much uh, money and, and things that we all despise and, and it's disheartening when we see waste goes on. But are you as disheartened when you see time, your time, my time, individually wasted or invested for the cause of Christ? Bible says redeeming the time because the days are evil. You see, when you live for eternity, you discover meaning and hope in today as being pleasing to God and you find purpose for life. Most people that have no purpose in life most people that have no uh, reason to live have not understood the importance of redeeming the time. The word redeem means to buy back. God says, here it is. Here's your time for today, 1,440 minutes. What are you going to do with it? And if we truly monitored how we use, and we just sort of went through, they tell you when you first uh, you know, go on a diet, they say the first couple of weeks, I want you to write down everything uh, that you, you eat throughout the day. Uh, if you're trying to, to budget your money, they say and for the next two weeks, I want you to write down everything that you purchase. I don't care if it's a $0.25, 25 cent, um, uh, you know, nothing can be bought for you. 25 cents, but you know, if it's a 50 cents candy bar, or if it's a $2 burger, or if it's a $20 pizza, whatever it might be, I want you to monitor every detail of what you've done. And so in two weeks, you look at everything you've eaten. In two weeks, you look at everything that you've spent your money on and realize, wow, I didn't know I spent that much money. I didn't know I, I had eaten that much food. How about your time? If you can monitor how you spend your time in a given day over a period of two weeks, we'd all be embarrassed humiliated and shocked at how much time that we all waste. The per most productive of us uh, would no doubt feel that way. And so as we look at this thing of redeeming the time, if I live for eternity, I find meaning of life. I find purpose of life. I find a reason to get up and to accomplish something in today. But if I'm not living for eternity, it's just another day to fill, fill up with stuff. Another day just to fill up with time. So number one, as we look at uh, preparing to know Jesus, where he says his name shall be, was called Jesus, which was so named that the angel before was conceived in the womb. They didn't know what that name was until eight days. It says his name is going to be called Jesus. I want you to see number two. Not only do we need to live in light of eternity, but I want you to ask God to give you a few people whom you can help come to know him and grow in him. Ask God this year to give someone or a couple of someones in your life that you can help them come to know God. You can help them come to grow in their faith with God. You see, if we can all invest in someone uh, that's maybe just on the peripheral, they're just starting to come to church, or maybe you leave in the Lord this year, and, and uh, maybe a little uh, family comes to church, and they're a new family, you just try to invest in them. You'll grow more. You'll know more about God and grow more in your faith to God as you help others grow. Uh, with God and walk with God. And so give, uh, ask God to give you some people that you can help come to know him and grow in him. An investment that always provides a positive return is an investment in the lives of people for the glory of God. You're not investing in them for your benefit. You're not investing in them to say, for them to say to you, you're such a wonderful person. You're not investing in them for them to, uh, you know, to, to, to give you accolades. You're investing in them for the glory of God. So God has a vessel of honor that he could use for his glory. Let me give you a verse here. <clears throat> Go to Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 28. So if I'm going to get to know Jesus in 2021, as his name was known eight days uh, into um, his, his um, existence as a human uh, in this life, we see in Matthew chapter 20, number one, uh, we've got to live life for eternal values. Every day, 
There ought to be some things of eternal significance. And again, I understand there's times you're going to spend uh, just, just filling life up with just stuff. It's temporal. Uh, it's just a filler. Uh, but something for you to end the day and feel successful and productive and feel like you accomplished something today, you've got to have something of eternal worth. You've got to have something of eternal value. You'll spin your wheels and be busy as can be from morning to night, but you'll be unfulfilled if you're not doing something of eternal nature, eternal value in your life. Number two, ask God to give you some people that you can help personally be used of God to help uh, come to know God better and uh, to grow uh, with God. Matthew chapter 20, look with me down in verse number 28. Matthew chapter 20, down to the beginning of verse number 28. Even as a son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life for ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. So here these two blind men, he's, he's journeying past them. They cry out. They hear the crowd. They hear the voices. They've heard about this man, Jesus. And the multitude... Verse 31, uh, there was a roundabout Jesus in the, the crowd there. Rebuked them because they should hold their peace. So they, they, they backed off these, these men here. They were crying out, causing disturbance. It's quiet, quiet. And they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. As we look at this passage of Scripture, there's a couple of things I want you to notice. As we look at investing in the lives of others, investing in the lives of others in 2021. Our life is more than just us, me, myself, and I. Uh, your life is more than just you. Uh, your life has been blessed of God, and you're saved today, and you're on your way to heaven to be a blessing to others, to impact others for the cause of Christ. And Jesus gives us that example. We see the encounter that Jesus had. Two blind men on the Jericho Road reveal several principles for investing in the lives of others. Look in verse uh, number 32. And the Bible says, Then Jesus, here it is, stood still. He stood still. Uh, number one, if we're going to make an impact in the lives of others this year, we've got to slow down. We've got to slow down. Life wants to put us in the fast lane. Life wants us to get here and get, hit the, the traffic and get rolling. And in the process, we're not able to impact and influence lives if we're in the fast lane of life. We've got to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to let us see the opportunities of people that cross our, cross our paths. And the Bible says, he stood still. Jesus stood still is what appears here on the story to, to uh, be a simple fact uh, is actually a significant step in serving others. He was leaving Jericho. He had another appointment to go to. He'd already spent time ministering to the people in Jericho. He's going to another town. But he stopped. He stopped. There's people all around us. Your ministering is not just a Sunday thing. I teach my Sunday school class. I pick that person up for church. I go and do these bus calls, and I bring these kids in on the bus route. Your ministry doesn't stop in the, or, or, the, your, is not confined to the, the walls of these buildings, this building here. Uh, your ministry is beyond just this building here. And so as he was going from one place to another, they cried out to him. The Bible says he stopped. I wonder if our pace of life has become so fast that we speed by ministry opportunities to be a blessing to people. God puts people across our path all the time. But we wouldn't know it because we're just so busy. We're running here and running there and going this way and going that way. And folks across our path that need us to care and to stop and to slow down. But we're so busy we miss the opportunities. He stopped. He slowed down. He allowed the temporary his temporary schedule to be interrupted for an eternal investment. And so we see here that uh, God allowed uh, the, 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 whatever your schedule is, it needs to be uh, uh, able to be interrupted. Uh, whatever our agenda is, it needs to be able to be interrupted because God wants to understand that if we're living in the light of eternity and we're trying to make an impact on people's lives, there's going to be times that's going to be out of our routine or out of our schedule or out of our plans or out of where we're going or what our direction is where God's going to put someone across your path that needs someone to just slow down. And the Bible says that Jesus stood still. Now, no one was more busy 
in life in Jesus. I mean, you talk about maximizing his time, living for eternity, and for any of us say, well, I just don't have time. He didn't have the time, but he understood the purpose of his existence uh, was to interact with people, slow down long enough to not miss the, the interruptions in your life for an eternal investment in people. Number two, I want you to see also what Jesus did here, uh, where the Bible says, he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Number one, what are we going to do to make a difference in people's lives? you got to slow down. got to slow down. Uh, we, and I understand we've got to stay on a schedule, and we've got to rush out to the bus and get on the bus and get the kids home. We're rushing in to get to our sense of class. We've got to rush here. But sometimes in our rushing to the next ministry, we maybe miss opportunities of people that are right there that need us to, to stand still, to give them a few moments of time, a few moments of attention, and let's not so get busy in ministry, rushing in ministry and in all of our stuff in life that we miss out on the opportunity to be a blessed people. Then number two, he saw the big picture. He saw the big picture. To minister effectively, we must embrace a servant mindset or a servant philosophy. Uh, the opening verse of our text describes the glorious uh, Savior as one who, what, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He came to serve, not to be served. If you need everyone to serve you, you're going to live a disappointed life. If you need everybody to come and shake your hand when you're at church, everybody be kind to you and reach out to you, you're going to get unfulfilled expectation. But Jesus didn't come to be ministered unto. He found his fulfillment in ministering and serving and being a blessing. Ministry should not be an inconvenience. People should not be an inconvenience. Uh, being able to represent our Savior should not be a bother. And, well, they, they don't appreciate what I do. Look, at, they didn't appreciate what Jesus did. They crucified him. But he didn't find fulfillment in everybody recognizing what good he was doing. He found fulfillment in doing the job that he was doing for the sake of seeing the big picture. The big picture of life is far greater than our own personal desires and dreams, ambitions and goals. When you see the big picture, you'll notice all people are important to God. Everybody's important to God. You may look at someone and make a judgment call and say, well, I, that's not a very important person. There, there may be a, a skid row person, street person. They may be someone that's a little bit uneducated. They may be someone else that uh, might be a little sloppy or whatever. And uh, when you begin to understand and see the big picture, you begin to see everyone's important to God. And uh, everyone has an impact on God. Philippians 2 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in a low list of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Uh, we get into trouble uh, when we begin to look at others and compare ourselves with what others are doing or what other recognitions are doing, uh, they're getting, and save a lowliness of mind that says what? Let each esteem other better than themselves. It's not about me getting the credit. It's about deferring that credit to somebody else. Uh, if we're all here, uh, one of the things as a leader that you'll learn, uh, as a leader, if everything goes good, you defer the, the, the goodness and the blessings and the victory and everything to those that served uh, to allow that to happen. And if it didn't go good, you as a leader take all the reason for why it didn't go good. It's so easy to take the other, the opposite, right? Things fall apart. It's your fault. Things go good. Well, look what I did. But as a leader, we're to give defer. As the Bible says here, let each esteem others. Listen, if we have a great results, give the results to others. And uh, give, give the, the blessing, give the, the, the compliment, credit to others. If things don't go good, then take the blame. Say, no, that was my fault. It should, we should have been a little bit more organized there. We should have done this a little bit more prepared. That was my fault. Now, all of us were a part of that failing, but the leader takes responsibility. All of us were part of that success, but the leader gives the deferring of the success. You guys did great. Boy, I'm so proud of you. And, uh, and so God says to esteem others, see the big picture. Slow down. If we're going to make an impact to people's lives, see the big picture. And then thirdly on this thought uh, is we've got to serve with compassion. Look at verse number 34. So we slow down, we see the big picture, and then we serve with compassion. So Jesus had compassion <clears throat> on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Men seek the applause of men when we ought to seek the approval of God. That's a great thought. Uh, are you seeking the applause of men or the approval of God? If you're seeking the approval of God, it doesn't matter what pats on the back or, or encouragements or we're so proud of you or whatever is done on that. And we ought to do that and strive to do that. But if we do what we do to get that, 
then we're going to be disappointed. And so we need to do it for the approval of God. Jesus did not serve for a compensation. He served by what? Compassion. He didn't do it for the dollar. He did it because of his love and desire uh, to minister to those people. Christ's honoring service is always motivated by compassion. Why do you do what you do? Is it because you want to represent the Savior well? You want to uh, serve the Savior? You want to serve with compassion? Christ's honoring service. Our reward's been reserved in heaven because no bank account on earth could contain the incomparable riches of his name shall be called Jesus. You're going to know him on the eighth day. His name was Jesus. Hey, this year, God said, I want you to know me. This is the heart of Jesus. He stood, he slowed down. He stopped. He stood still. He saw the big picture. I didn't come to be served. I came to be a servant. And he had compassion as he ministered. Number three, let me give this next thought. So I said to ask God to give you a few people that you can invest in, that can know him and grow in him. Uh, find a, a way, as we looked at number one, uh, that uh, God would find someone in your life that, uh, that you could, um, what was that one here? I just lost that thought. What was it? Um, what was that first point we saw? Oh, live in light of eternity. I'm sorry. So live in light of eternity. Then number three, don't make resolutions, make commitments this year. Don't, don't make resolutions, make commitments. The Bible says in Psalm or Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Don't resolve to do something, commit to do something. So that's just sort of a play on words. They mean the same thing, huh? They don't. Why do we begin a new year full of hopes and promises or to fall back into old habits and old way of thinking? It's because we're trying to accomplish our goals without the one who has the best interest at heart. We're making a resolution. We're resolving to do something in our own power. A commitment depends upon a power outside of ourselves. Instead of a resolution, what if we made a commitment? What would it look like for us? Uh, what would we see ourselves through the eyes of God's Word? Uh, would it make a difference? A resolution, listen now, is an act of resolving or deciding on a course of action. But a commitment is far stronger because it's a pledge or a promise or an obligation. I resolve. I'm deciding to do this. A commitment, though, is a pledge or obligation. Resolution means the act of determining upon an action. That's nice, but it's, there's no real action. It's a desire to do something, but you don't do anything. It's a wish to accomplish something, but you don't do anything for that wish. It's a dream that you have, but you never do anything to fulfill that dream. The act of determining is sedentary. There's no action. That there's no movement. Uh, there's no, it makes you feel good. I'm going to do this this year. And they tell us uh, over 80% of our resolutions are, are out, the, out the window two weeks into the year. 80%. And so our, our hearts mean right. Uh, our, we're sincere. We really resolve to do this. It's a wish, a desire. But there's no action or commitment to do it. To determine means to settle or decide but it doesn't require any actual involvement. It's one thing to want to do something. It's another thing to commit to do something. You can say, I want to lose weight this year. I want to get in shape this year. I want to walk with God this year. I want to get victory in this area of my life this year. But it's going to take some commitment to be able to get that want uh, to become a, a reality in your life. So you make the determination, then you're done. You've decided what you're going to do. You've, you've resolved to do it. But no wonder result, resolutions get dropped. Uh, you're not doing anything. A commitment, on the other hand, means the act of engaging oneself. You get involved. To engage means to occupy yourself. This implies full focus. The word commitment means the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or activity. And so when you make a commitment... It can, uh, 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 gives the impression much more sustained emphasis than I'm making a resolution. A resolution just says, this is what I want to do. This is what I, what I would desire to do. This is what I'm planning to do. And it makes us feel good until two weeks into it or a month into it. And then we're more discouraged, right, more defeated. And that's why we come to a year like this and says, I don't believe in resolutions because all we did was what we, we wished for what we wanted but we didn't put any action or effort or involvement or participation on our part. Uh, make a list of New Year commitments. Choosing things that are meaningful that'll, 
uh, in those three areas, improve your life, improve your relationships, and improve your walk with God. And that commitment will elicit an excitement to engage in the follow-through. And so it gives you more of uh, uh, an active involvement in what you're doing. You're committed to doing something. You do what you're committed to do. If you're committed to learn, learn a new skill or a new language or, or to do, you know, improve on something, when there's commitment, you do it. But there's a lot of us that have dreams and wishes and desires and goals, ambition, resolutions. We want to do this, but we never follow through and do it. Let me give you the next number four. Now, here we have number four. So live for eternity. Find people to invest in. <clears throat> make res don't make resolutions. Make commitments. Commit thy works on the Lord. Commit to do what's right in these areas. And number, number four, don't look horizontally for what only can be found vertically. Don't look horizontally for what can only be found uh, vertically. Don't allow yourself to be seduced into believing that life can be found in people, in possessions, in situations, in locations, in experiences of life. Remember, you'll find no fulfillment in created things. That's a small statement, but that's a powerful truth. You'll find no lasting fulfillment in created things. Because you were created to find fulfillment in the Creator. And when you're trying to utilize all that God's created in people and, and things and, and, and our, our you know, surroundings, you'll be unfulfilled. Uh, there'll be no satisfaction. There's an emptiness there. There's no fulfillment in trying to allow these created things to fill the void that only God can create. So don't look horizontally for what only a vertical uh, relationship can be found. Uh, remember, the role of created things is not to give you life or fulfill your life, but to point you to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the purpose of all the things you have. It's not to find fulfillment uh, in life. Refuse to try to satisfy your heart's longings with things that can never offer you satisfaction that you think. We must think vertically if anything is going to make sense horizontally. You're looking at life trying to figure it out horizontally. But you'll never figure out life thinking horizontally. You've got to look at life thinking vertically from God's perspective. Uh, for example, uh, we all desperately search for identity. But if we're looking for our identity and value and significance and importance horizontally, we'll look for a relationship. We'll look for the approval of others. We'll look for material possessions. Or sometimes we find our identity in things that are destructive, drugs, alcohol, pornography, immoral relationships. However, when you look horizontally to the physical realm to provide hope, you'll always be disappointed and end up hopeless. Because nothing on this plane, horizontally, will ever bring satisfaction because God created us with a vertical of uh, emptiness and void that can only be filled. So if you're looking for anything created to fill a void in your life, you'll always have a void. And that void will be bigger than it ever was when you find out that that didn't fill it. You'll only find the void filled uh, with the Creator. Maybe not at first, but no created thing or person can ever take the place of our Creator God. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, it is fulfilling for a moment. Sin's fun for a moment, uh, but operating from a horizontal basis means you're trying to fix problems through your own self-efforts, and, and uh, looking from a vertical position means you're seeking God for answers. You're seeking God for solutions. You're seeking God for direction. But don't look at the horizontalness of life and look at it from a horizontal perspective. Well, here's what I'm going to do to fix this problem. It's not going to solve it. It's not going to fix it. Uh, I was telling some of the folks uh, a moment ago, uh, uh, before church started, I said, you know, it's often what happens, we, we give up one sin, and uh, we give up maybe one, one thing in our life, and we give that up, but then we gain 20 pounds. So we're just going from one to another to something else, and so we're, de we're trying to deal with situations on a horizontal level instead of looking from a vertical viewpoint. The moment you and I take responsibility, God quietly stands back. And lets us experience failure until we give our the responsibility back to him. If you've got responsibility for any area of your life, God's just standing back and he's waiting for you to fall. Because you're looking at life from the horizontal viewpoint. 
You're looking at how you're going to solve this problem from the horizontal view. You're looking at how you're going to get out of debt from the horizontal viewpoint. You're looking at how you're going to find happiness from a horizontal viewpoint. And as long as you take the responsibility, God just stands back and he's going to wait till you fail. And then when you fail and you've exhausted everything that you've done on the horizontal level, then God's available when we turn to him and God can do the rest. One of the best examples of the contrast between the vertical and the horizontal dimension is the story of King Saul and David. We won't turn there for the sake of time, but in 1 Samuel 25, you can look at it a little bit later this week. But King Saul thought the way to preserve his kingdom, horizontal, the way to preserve my kingdom is what? I better kill David. That was his viewpoint. He says, I, I got my kingdom here. And so he was going to deal with the problem of David taking over the kingdom by killing, uh, by killing David. And so while in pursuit of him, there were several occasions where David had an opportunity to kill Saul. And what did David say? I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to do what belongs to God, even though he's in the wrong. Even though he's not doing the right thing, he's chasing me to kill me. I'm not going to take it in my hands and try to bring judgment or punishment to someone else. That's God. And I don't want to get in that mix there. And so David always withheld and to restrain himself. He had respect for those that had been put under authority by God that were over him. Saul represents the exact opposite of this principle. He thought David was a problem. So he, got, he thought to get rid of him. As a result, Saul lost the kingdom because he chose to rule, rule horizontally instead of ruling vertically with God at the center of his life. And you and I will lose everything we have. Every relationship you have, hold dear to you, every, everything that you think is important in your life, you'll lose it all if you try to maneuver and manipulate and oversee it and, and control it from a horizontal level. You've got to look at it from a vertical point. No matter what problem you face today, stay vertical with God. Stay vertical with God. Don't allow, that's why it says, mount up with wings as eagles. Get above. Don't get on the horse. Now, then lastly, and there's so many we can give on all these points as we want to know Jesus uh, for this upcoming year, but live, live life in, in, in life of eternity, in light of eternity. Uh, find someone to invest in, to grow. Who, who, who did you invest in this year? Uh, who's in church because of your investment? Uh, who's closer to God this year because of your time with them? Who's learned how to go soloing this year because of your time of training them and helping them? Who's more involved in church this year because of your investment in their life? That ought to be our goal every year and as we begin this, uh, this next year. And, and so don't live horizontally, uh, but live um, vertically. And then don't make resolutions, make commitments. And then lastly, work to assure yourself that praise always replaces complaint. Work to assure that praise this year, 2021, always replaces complaint. It's sad but true, but the default language of every one of us as sinners is complaint. That's a default language, complaining. You don't have to think about it, don't have to work for it. The first thing out of your mouth without any restraint is complaining. Because sin causes me to think that life is all about me, it also causes me to constantly find reasons of being dissatisfied with my life. See, if life is always centered around me, I'm always going to be dissatisfied because I can't even satisfy myself. I can't find fulfillment in myself. If I was asked somebody, okay, what do you want to be happy? If you got it, you'd still be unhappy. Uh, if you earned it or, or obtained it or had it, it wouldn't bring fulfillment in your life. And so when I focus, when the dissatisfied person is a self-focused person. Uh, a very contented person is someone that's not self-focused. Because it's not about me, it's about ministering. He came to minister, give his life for ransom. And so because sin causes us to think that life is all about me, it causes me to constantly find reason to be dissatisfied with my life. When you and I are living for something bigger than self, and we're committed to living that life for God, then all of a sudden we find a renewed purpose, a renewed direction of life, a new fulfillment that comes. How many of us, you can look at our lives and say, you know what, this has been a dissatisfied year. It's been dissatisfied to the extent that it's been about you. It's been about me. If it's been a great year and, and not dissatisfied, it's been a very content year, it, it shows that you've not been living for yourself. You've been living for others. So you don't define how good this year was based upon how you feel you were so dissatisfied and unjustly treated. You look at this great year. Because you've lived this life not about you, but about being a blessing, being an encouragement, being a strength for each and every one. I wonder how different we would all be as an individual 
as a church, if we just took some of these simple principles, and Jesus says on the eighth day, or the Bible says on the eighth day, his name will be called Jesus. His name will be called Jesus. God says, I want you to know the Christ of Christmas. He was born. Eight days later, he was circumcised, and his name was called Jesus, as it was given to him before his conception. And so God said, I want you to know the Christ of Christmas. You know what? As much as we've focused on Jesus and leading up to Christ and the, or the Christmas and the songs we've sung and the manger story and the, all the stuff about Jesus, I wonder if already eight days into it almost, we've already gotten back in the rut. We've forgotten about Jesus. It was all the heyday. We've taken everything down and everything shifted to the next thing. And we're moving forward. And we just had just a little sliver of slot. We were focused on Jesus. And we didn't even wait till the eighth day. To realize his name is going to be revealed on that eighth day. And we've already gotten so moved on in our life that the Christmas has moved on. We've gotten what we thought we wanted. we got the gifts here. and Everything's around us and all that we've got. And then we come to the point where we go through another year unfulfilled, unsatisfied, unhappy, uh, disgruntled, discontented. And it's all because God says, I wanted you to know me. I was born so you would know me. I want to be known of you. And so let's decide this year, as we look at these three areas of, co of commitments, I want to make a commitment. God, how do you want to work on me? What, what changes do I, what commitments do I need to make in my life this year that I need to be working on with your help to improve upon? God, what commitment in regards to relationships do I need to work on? What areas of my life do I need to work on relationship-wise? And then thirdly, what uh, things spiritually commitments do I need to make? that you want me to begin working on. Not that I want to do, but God, what do you want me to do? And then God will let you know who his name is, and you'll grow in this walk this upcoming year. It'll be a great year. And uh, let's get the focus on ministering, slowing down, the lives of others. You won't live a dissatisfied life, but if it's all about you, you get dissatisfied. Someone didn't call you. Someone didn't do that. Someone didn't recognize you. Someone didn't applaud you. Someone didn't pat you on the back. And someone didn't recognize what a great person you are. And you just feel so unworthy and un unimportant and insignificant. You're, you're, you're showing how you're looking all about you. It's all about you. And when you begin to look at others, you don't even notice that anymore. And that's why Paul says we're to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God. It's hard to offend a dead person. You can yell and cuss him out and do everything you want, but he's dead. And God said, I want you to die daily. Paul said, I die daily. You know why? It's not about me. It's all about you. It's not about how people treat me. It's all about you. It's not about what they recognize. It's all about you. Father, help us tonight as we transition from 2020 to 2021 that we would, we would have a perspective uh, that would allow us to know the Jesus. On that eighth day, his name will be called Jesus. Uh, Lord, I, I, we want to know you this year. And that we don't want to be about us and us at the forefront. And we're always, our feelings are on our shoulders. And we're always getting upset. And we're always feeling betrayed. Or we're always feeling misunderstood. Or we're always feeling neglected. Or we're always feeling this. Lord, help us to get outside of the, 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 simpli the foolishness of living for self and to do what Jesus came to do. To seek and to say that was his loss. He came not to be ministered and served, but he came to serve and to minister others. Lord, give us revival in 2021. Lord, help our hearts to be good soil that you've prepared us, you've plowed us, you've fertilized us in 2020. And uh, Lord, we're ready for a great harvest in this upcoming year. Give us, Lord, a year of safety and protection, a spiritual usability. Uh, Lord, we pray for souls to be saved. We pray that we'd have the privilege to invest in the lives of others. And uh, Lord, that we'd be able to stay faithful and true to you and grow in our faith. Grow in our walk with you, our trust in you, and to be a testimony that would honor you. We live our lives above reproach, and that, Lord, that we would be a Christian, that would be a good ambassador, a representative of you in a great way. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for a great year you've given to us. We look forward with anticipation of even a greater year in 2021. Thank you for our church family, the love we share together, or the mission field you've placed us in. Lord, help us to kick it off uh, right Saturday, boy, with a, a good turnout and, and starting the year right. Uh, Lord, to reach our city for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank